So we have come to our final session, and just a reminder, when we get finished, we'll have a break before the Q&A time. There's uh, quite a few questions, and at that time, that's when Debbie will take uh, the last books, if you want any, and then she'll be packing up, so just to keep that in mind. So anyway, we have come to our final session now that we've learned how to walk in wisdom in our home and in the church and in our singleness and in the world. We're going to look at how to walk in wisdom in our calling. Uh, and what I mean by that is those of us who have been called by God are to walk in a certain manner. And so hopefully, hopefully this will give us aid in really knowing whether we're redeemed or not. Uh, it's a good examination passage, but also to make sure that we're walking in godly wisdom and not in the wisdom of the world, which is foolishness. So if you would open your Bibles to James chapter 3, James chapter 3, and we will be consider, considering walking in wisdom from James 3, 13 to 18. Age has nothing to do with wisdom, said Simple. I know a man who's 52 years old who never goes home except to take, take a bath and change his underwear. And, you know, that is in indeed a true statement about wisdom. I have met women who are older than I am who seem to have very little wisdom. Yet, I have met women who are far younger than I am who seem to be possessed with a lot of wisdom. And so that leads us to a question. Wisdom, what is wisdom? What does the Bible say about wisdom? Uh, for those of us who have been called by God out of darkness into light, what does the Bible say as we think about walking in wisdom and being holy and blameless in love? We're told in Colossians 4 or 5 that we are to walk in wisdom towards those that are outside. And indeed, we saw how to do that last night in our first session, walking in wisdom in the world. Proverbs 31, 26, and talking about the virtuous woman, it says, she opens her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. And we saw how we are, as women are to walk in the church and in our home, how we walk in wisdom. We also were told in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise instruction. In our last session, we just had Tim, or Paul told Timothy how to walk. He gave him instruction and how he should conduct himself in wisdom. And we especially looked at singling out the singles. And so we have come to our final session, walking in wisdom in our calling. Those of us who have been called by God should be walking in wisdom in all avenues of life, whether it's our home, whether it's the church, or whether it's in the world. So the question is, how can you know for sure you're walking in wisdom? How can you know for sure that you are a genuine believer? What things do we need to look for in our lives to make sure that we are walking worthy of our calling. Well, tucked away in this portion of James 3 are some great nuggets of truth regarding wisdom. You know, often, uh, you know, when I was told what I was going to speak on this year, walking in wisdom, you know, my mind goes to Proverbs because Proverbs is wisdom literature. But did you know that James is the Proverbs of the New Testament? James is a piece of wisdom literature, and I would encourage you, if you've never memorized scripture, I would start with James. Great epistle, five chapters, pretty short, and it flows very well, and it's a great counseling book and a great book for wisdom. So James is going to answer a very vital question for us. How do I know if I possess wisdom that comes from God or from the world? So let's look at this portion, James 3, 13 to 18. Notice what James writes. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, don't boast, don't lie against the truth. This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonical. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in them in peace by those who make peace. 
So we're going to see the characteristics of the wise. What does a wise woman look like? We're going to look at that in verse 13. And then we're going to look at the characteristics of demonic wisdom. These would be people that are walking according to the world. They do not have godly wisdom. And more than likely, if you find yourself in this category, I would, ex I would challenge you to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Because this is demonic wisdom. And then lastly, we're going to look at the characteristics of divine wisdom. So... Now, the context here, again, we're jumping into the middle of a book of the Bible, but it's pretty interesting. As most of you know, James 3 is that chapter when you read, you put duct tape over your mouth when you get done. Because he's talking about the tongue, right? He starts out, my brethren, be not many teachers, knowing you receive a stricter judgment, which should put fear in the all, all of us, right? Especially those of us who teach the word of God. Every time I look at that book table or I think, wow, there's a lot of accountability and I'm going to be held to a stricter judgment. And so that should put soberness uh, into all of us who are teachers. But then he says, you know, in many things we all stumble. In other words, with the, with the mouth, uh, the teacher speaks, right? And so she or he is very accountable. But then he goes on to say uh, that you're not off the hook because we all stumble with our speech, right? Right. All of us in here have stumbled from one time or another with our tongue. And, you know, even though our tongue is contained in our mouth and it's surrounded by our lips and our teeth, it escapes, you know, it gets out. So what causes it to escape? Is it lack of intelligence? No, it's lack of wisdom, right? And so that's why he goes in to this subject about wisdom. So he says, who is wise and understanding among you? Who are those, in other words, in this passage, who are those who should be chosen to have public speaking? Who should be teachers? Who is this wise and understanding person? Now, ladies, just because you're not a public speaker, you are not off the hook. The reason for that is every one of us in this room uses our mouths to give instruction, right? I imagine most of you that are wives, you gave some instructions to your husband before you left home this morning, right? Uh, in fact, yesterday when I talked to my husband, I said, did you get the mail? Because that's one thing I, I ask him to do when I'm gone, because I'm the one that gets the mail every day. And so I have to remind me, did you get the mail? So we all use our tongues, right, for giving instruction. Might be a friend, might be a coworker, might be a, a Christian woman here at the church, your children, even parents. Sometimes we give instruction to our parents, especially as they're aging. We influence people with our speech. Therefore, we need wisdom, right? Wisdom that comes from God. So the word wise man here, who is wise and understanding, describes a person who possesses wisdom that can be a resource for instructing others. Ladies, not only should those who are called by God possess wisdom, but James says they should be endued with knowledge, or your, under, or your translation might say, understanding, understanding. In fact, uh, this is the only time these words are used in the New Testament. But this is someone who's able to apply the knowledge that she or he has to practical situations. Ladies, knowledge are facts, right? We can know knowledge about the Bible, but not have wisdom. So we take that knowledge that we know and we apply it. We can apply those knowledgeable things that we know, and that is wisdom. It puts wisdom into practice, into practical situations. Now, notice the kind of person who possesses this kind of wisdom and knowledge must also, notice what James says, have a good and upright life. They must have good conduct. Ladies, this is the first characteristic of a wise person who has been called by God and is walking in wisdom. And we've talked a lot about it this week, right? Your, your character, your example, your pattern, you must have an upright life. James says, let him show out of his life, his good life, his works with meekness of wisdom. You know what James says? Time for show and tell. Okay, you say you're a Christian. You say you know the Bible. You say you have understanding. Let me see it. Let me see it. 
Let me see it by your good conduct, your upright life. Ladies, wisdom is not measured by degrees, but by deeds. Remember before this, James has says, you say you have faith without works. You show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Not that we're saved by works, but faith produces what? Works, right? An upright, godly life. Ladies, if you're called by God, and I hope everyone in you in, in here is, has been called by God. If not, I hope before you put your head on your pillow tonight that you'll repent and give your life over to the Lordship of Christ. But a woman who has been called by God should be holy. She should have a life that has been changed by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. And it changes how she lives, right? She lives in good conduct. And her life will not manifest good deeds once in a while, but her whole life will be characteristic of good works. Because why? That's what's happened to her heart. Ladies, that's the promise of the new covenant. Did you know that? God says in Ezekiel, I will put my law within your heart and my spirit within you. I will change that heart of stone to pliable and I will cause you to walk in my ways. He gives us a new heart. Ladies, there are many today who profess to be wise and knowledgeable, but they do not possess an upright life. They don't. I mean, I had a friend one time, and the pastor was coming to Canada. And you know the questions she asked him? I thought it was pretty bold. She said, when's the last time you looked at pornography? I was like, wow, that's a, that's a bold question to ask a pastoral candidate. But maybe it needs to be asked, right? What does your personal life look like? Upright life. You know, we've lost our zeal for holiness, haven't we? We've lost our zeal for sanctification and to be set apart. Ladies, to, be, to say that we are called by God and that we possess some kind of wisdom and knowledge and not live a life that is holy is hypocrisy, right? It's hypocrisy. I've told women often, to get off the fence. Either decide you're going to live for the Lord or, or go live for the world. But to stay in the middle like that, it's a blaspheme to the word of God, right? And to the power of the gospel that we say that we have been saved by. Ladies, be careful about hypocrisy. It's very serious. In fact, Jesus pronounces a series of woes on those who are hypocrites. A very scary warning in Matthew chapter 6. Well, notice what James says. These works that we perform should be performed how? With harshness? No, we've already looked at this, right, this weekend. Meekness. Meekness. That th same thing we saw last night. When we walk in wisdom before the world, we are to what? Be meek. We are to be meek. Meekness of wisdom. This is the second characteristic of a wise woman who has been called by God. She is meek. She is gentle. And she performs her good works in a spirit of meekness. Ladies, we who are called by God should act like God's daughters, right? And what does it say about our Lord? He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs with his arms, and he carries them in his bosom. And what? Harshly leads those that are young? No, gently. Gently leads those who are with young. Or even the call to the gospel, come unto me, all you that are heavy, burdened, and laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am what? Meek, or gentle, meek, and lowly of heart, and you will find what? Rest to your soul. Ladies, gentleness or meekness is a characteristic of a woman who's been called by God and is walking in wisdom. Now, one of the questions on the questions here in a little bit is, this question right here, what well, is meekness? Could you explain it? So I explained it last night, but I'll explain it again today and then if, or right now. And if it's not explained enough, I'll explain it some more here in a minute in our Q&A time. Meekness or gentleness is not passivity. It's not weakness. Gentleness is not weakness. It is strength under control. That is meekness. It's a fruit of the spirit, right? Now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, self-control. A person who is meek is not arrogant. A person who is meek does not fight for his or her rights. A person who is meek does not demand that his personal views be accepted. 
He's characterized, or she's characterized, by modesty and meekness. Paul says in Titus 3, 2, we are to show meekness to all men. All men, we are to be meek. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive but be meek. We must be meek. We must be gentle. And even when we're confronting someone, uh, speaking the truth in love, we are to what? Paul says in Galatians 6, 1, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Meekness, gentleness, strength under control. So if I come to you and I say, you know, I've been watching your life and I'm really concerned because I've seen this pattern of sin and, and I really want to talk to you about this and here's what the scripture says and, you know, I love you enough, I, I love you enough, I want to tell you this. And, you know, next week you may be coming to talk to me about a situation in my life and I welcome that. I welcome for you to come to me and confront me if you think I'm out of line. Ladies, that's somebody who walks in meekness, not thinking that you have all the answers and that you're above the person that you're talking to. We're meek, we consider ourselves, but we're strong, right? And it's the same way in a marriage, and I think that's what the question is uh, asking me here in a little bit, but in a marriage, when, you know, it's strength under control, even when you have to lovingly go confront your husband. Honey, I'm really concerned. This pattern in your life is not good, and, and I, you know, God's word says this, and I don't see this, and I'm really concerned about you. And it's strength under control. It's not weakness. It's not passivity. It's not silence. But it doesn't mean that we are out of control and disrespectful even when we are talking to our husbands. Ladies, this should give us food for thought, especially when we consider our calling by God. So what are the characteristics of a wise woman called by God? Her conduct is upright, and her works are done in meekness. Does this describe you? Do you endeavor to live a life that is one of integrity and are all of your works done in meekness, with the meekness of Christ? Well, what happens if I don't walk in meekness? What happens if my life is not conducted in holiness? Well, we turn to what a wise woman looks like, to someone who is not walking in wisdom, but walking in the characteristics of demonic wisdom. And ladies, listen very carefully. If you find yourself in this category, you might want to check your calling to see if it's genuine. Peter says, make sure of your calling. Make sure your election is sure. And this would be a good time to be serious with yourself and ask yourself which category you fall in. So he says, but in contrast to those who are wise, but if you have bitter envy and strife or self-seeking in your hearts, don't boast about this. Don't lie against the truth. Apparently, some in James' day are just like some in our day. They're using their knowledge for an opportunity to puff themselves up. Self-glorification. I may have told you this story before, but there's new people here, so I'll tell it again. Many years ago, I wasn't speaking at a conference, but I had a book table at a conference. And I was sitting at lunch, ladies were here, men were over here, and this was speaker table, and this man. And I heard one of the men say to another person at the table, I, I'm, I'm, can, I am, uh, what's that word? When you can do every, several things at one time? Yes, I can do that. And uh, so I was listening to this, but I was listening to this, and I heard this man say, you don't know me? You don't know who I am? Well, my name is so-and-so, and I travel with so-and-so, and I've written all these books, these Christian books. And I looked at Debbie, and I said, did you hear what that man did? And, <laughs> and I looked to see what his name was, and I go, well, I'm not going to any of his sessions. I can tell you right now, that is an arrogant man. Self-glorification. You know what? A year later, it was discovered he's had to step down from ministry. He committed adultery with several women. He's one of those 30% of pastors that's committing adultery with someone, I guess, in his church. Ladies... James says, that is boasting against the truth. And some were doing this in James, say, oh, I have knowledge, and it's a time for me to puff up myself. And James says, if you have bitter envy, or you have harsh zeal and selfish ambition, don't boast about this. Don't lie. Don't kid yourself. You're not a Christian. They were promoting themselves. In fact, this speaks to the envious attitude of the heart and mind that causes us to feel sorrow, sorrow when someone excels 
in, sell, excels us in some ministry or manner. It's an evil jealousy. Ladies, demonic wisdom produces bitter envy. So if you have envy and selfish ambition in your heart, you want to get ahead of others, beware. That is not meekness. That is not wisdom from God. If you think you're superior to everybody, then beware this is not from the one who's called you, right? He himself was lowly and meek and gentle. He came to what? Not to be served, but to serve, right? And to give his life a ransom for many. So demonic wisdom is also self-seeking, James says. It produces strife, your translation might say. This word depicts somebody who goes out to work just for the money they can get out of it. That's all they want to do. Just money, money, money. Not just to work because they're called to work, but they want money. It's a selfish and a self-willed attitude along with a feuding and contentious spirit. Ladies, devilish wisdom produces strife. Produces strife. So if you have bitter envy and strife, James says, don't boast. Don't lie against the truth. Stop glorying in this. Stop kidding yourself. <laughs> Don't think you've arrived in your spiritual walk if this describes you, right? What did Paul say in another place? God forbid that I should glory except what? In the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we glory in, right? Not in ourselves. James says, don't lie against the truth. Don't be boastful thinking you're wise while all the while you're lying against the truth. In other words, ladies, bitter envy and strife is contrary to the true wisdom of God. And when you think about it, have you ever been, been around someone that boasts all the time? I, besides that person I was mentioning, boast, boast, boast. They're also usually liars, aren't they? Have you ever noticed that? They're liars. They lie against truth. My friend, you can claim to be wise, but if you're acting in these ways, it's against the truth, it's against Jesus Christ and the wisdom he possesses. If you are dominated by jealousy and selfish ambition, James, who is writing by the power of the Holy Spirit, says stop it. Stop being boastful. Stop lying against the truth. Ladies, you negate the gospel. If these are your attitudes, you negate the gospel by these ungodly attitudes, regardless of how wise you claim to be. Don't kid yourself, James says. Attitudes, speech, and works that are accompanied by bitterness and jealousy are not indications of wisdom that comes from above. In fact, he goes on to say, he's very clear, verse 15, this wisdom does not descend from above. That type of wisdom does not come from God, from those who are called by him. But what? Here's what it is. It's earthly, sensual, demonical. Ladies, these three things are interesting because they are also the three believers' enemies, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil, right? He says this wisdom does not descend from above. It has three characteristics, which are earthly, sensual, and demonical. So what is the first one? Ungodly wisdom is earthly. In other words, this wisdom has its origin in the world, and it's exhibited by men who are governed by worldly principles. It's temporal, it's mundane, it's concerned with the physical world and not the spiritual world. Paul says in Philippians 3 that the enemies of the cross of Christ set their mind on earthly things, earthly things. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.20, there is a wisdom that is of this world, you know, it's shocking to me at times the advice I hear from Christians that is based on nothing more than worldly philosophies. It has nothing to do with God and his word and the sufficiency of scripture. Ladies, be careful what you listen to and who you get advice from. Very scary. The second characteristic of devilish wisdom at its sensual. It's from the flesh. This wisdom is natural. It's unspiritual. It's a wisdom that springs from mental and emotional impulses. In fact, we get our English word psychology from this word. Ladies, people that are steeped in psychology are emotional. They're unstable. That is not godly wisdom. 
If you desire to walk in wisdom in your calling, I would beg you to flee from the psychology of our day. It's very dangerous, very, very dangerous. It denies the sufficiency of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, and what Paul or Peter tells us that he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. You don't need a psychiatrist. You don't need a psychologist. You need a good Christian friend that will speak truth to you, right? Ladies, it will not help you, but it will harm you. And it will only make your problems worse. In fact, I had a woman one time, she came in for counseling, and she said, I've been to, I don't know how many Christian counselors she said I've been to. She said, you're the first counselor that's told me I'm in sin. I'm like, really? And I was like, that's why I don't say I'm a Christian counselor. I say I'm a biblical counselor because the Bible has the answers, right? Christian is such an ambiguous term anymore. But ladies, people that are steeped in psychology, mark my word, they're very, very steeped in emotional, unstable problems. Why? Why is, why is that so wrong for us as Christians? Because, ladies, you've got to deal with the root causes that start in the issue of your heart, right? You have to deal with man's heart, which we know is depraved and desperately wicked. That's where all problems start, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What a man thinks in his heart so is he, right? And so we have to deal with the issue of the heart. The third characteristic of demonic wisdom, it's of the devil. It's of the devil. Evil spirits rather than God's spirits promote this type of wisdom. It's the, it's the wisdom, satanic wisdom that we saw last night with Eve in the garden. Remember? Oh, yeah, just take this, bite this fruit. It will make you wise, right? Go ahead, come on, do it. 1 Timothy 4.1 talks about doctrines of demons in the last days that are energized by Satan. And you know what they are? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain food which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. So there's doctrines of demons that John talks about, Paul talks about. Also, John writes in his letter that other spirits besides the Holy Spirit can energize preachers and teachers. Did you know that? 1 John 4, 1 to 6 talks about it below. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Ladies, there's many preachers and teachers today that are not energized by the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Kenneth Copeland casting out COVID-19, but right at the end of that video, I mean, if there was the devil's looks in the eyes, it's there. It is downright frightening. That man must be possessed by the devil. There are preachers and teachers out there today that are energized by the devil. Dear one, if someone gives you advice that does not measure up to God's word, beware. Beware. It's earthly. It's sensual. It's demonical. Get away from it. Don't listen to it. James goes on to describe this ungodly wisdom in verse 16. He says, For where envy and self-seeking is, confusion and every evil work is there. Ladies, where there's envy and strife, they are, there are disastrous results. Confusion. Every evil work. <laughs> In fact, the disaster is just that. Confusion, which is disorder, turmoil. That's what we're seeing right now in our world, isn't it? That's energized by the evil one. Confusion, disorder, turmoil. These people are unstable. I've been around people whose lives are filled with confusion because they have bought into the world's wisdom. Their thinking is bizarre. It's bizarre. And ladies, we've seen this recently with the riots and the plundering of business and tearing down of statues. And, you know, now they want to burn the Jesuses and they, you know, can feel like they can intrude into people's homes and start shooting people. People are irrational right now. People are irrational. They're acting like fools. And it comes from no other place but the devil. It's of the devil. It's devilish. Instead of promoting harmony, this wisdom produces disruption and unruliness. And ladies, all sorts of confusions, from arguments in your home to tension in the church, all this can be a result if you're not walking in God's wisdom, the wisdom that is meek, gentle, full of good conduct. Remember, God is not the author of confusion, right? He's not the author of confusion, but of peace. 
So it's clear wisdom that uh, is from him does not bring confusion. So demonic wisdom not only produces envy, strife, and confusion, but notice what James says. Every evil work, every evil work. Ladies, every evil practice takes place where ungodly wisdom is present. In fact, the Greek language means it's good for nothing. Good for nothing. Every evil action you can think of exists alongside of false wisdom. And James says it's worthless. It's worthless. It's worldly. You know, it may seem right now to the world that, you know, all these things that are going on in our world, oh, this is so wise, and let's just defund the police, and let's do all, oh, how wise we are. No, it's, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. Human wisdom that is unaided by the Spirit of God is not a safe guide to any truth, but especially to spiritual truth. Ladies, if left to ourselves, human wisdom very quickly can become tainted with jealousy, personal ambition, and eventually your life will be filled with evil deeds. That's what's happening in our world today. And the fact that it's happening in the church, too, is very alarming. I don't know if you've, you know, taken note of that. The fact that it's happening in the church is alarming. I want to encourage you, ladies. I love you girls. I've been here I don't know how many years, but... Uh, I want to encourage you, measure everything you hear by the Word of God. Everything. When you seek counsel from other, others, make sure they back it up with Scripture. I remember one time a young girl came to me at one of my conferences, and I was sitting there, and she sat next to me. And she goes, I have a question for you. And I said, yes. I just got married. And I said, yes. And she said, the ladies in this church, they tell me i got to date my husband every week. And she goes, what do you think about that? And I said, well, I'd go back to him and ask him where that is in the Bible. She goes, oh. I said, respectfully, but ask him where that is in the Bible. I don't think Abraham and Sarah had a date, but, you know, maybe so. But I said, you know, be gracious. But, and then I went on to tell her how I wasn't a big fan of Christian marriage books because they put pressure on Christian couples that's not even in the scriptures. And let's go see what the Bible has to say about marriage, right? And so when someone gives you counsel, just graciously say, well, could you show me that in the scriptures? Where is that in the scriptures, what you're telling me? Make sure. Another concern I have is even when you do give counsel that's from the Bible, make sure it's in its context, you know? I've heard scripture ripped completely out of its context to prove something that my friend just ain't there. That's an Oklahoma saying. It just ain't there. And so uh, make sure that it is backed up with scripture. Be careful about what you read. Be careful about the books you read, even the Christian books. Be careful and make sure that they are biblical. You know, once you get these 66 books mastered, then you can go on to other stuff, right? I don't know anyone that has these 66 books mastered. But he, God left you 66 letters that are full of wisdom. Do you know them? Have you read them? Have you studied them? Memorized them? This is where you find wisdom, right? So the characteristics of demonic wisdom... It's earthly, it's sensual, it's demonical. What does it produce? Disastrous things like envy, strife, confusion, selfishness, arrogance, and all kinds of evil works. My friend, if this describes you, I would highly, 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 highly encourage you to examine your calling. Make sure it's real. So you might say, well, Susan, how can I know if I am walking in divine wisdom. How can I know? Well, thankfully we can know because the Bible tells us right here in verse 17 of chapter 3 of James. But in contrast to demonic wisdom, we have godly wisdom. What does it look like? Look what James says. It's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Ladies, these are the fruits of divine wisdom. Very different from what comes from here, right? Envy, strife, jealousy, confusion, and evil. And by the way, you don't need a college education to get this wisdom. You don't need to go off to school. There are seven characteristics of wisdom. The first one is it's pure. It's pure. And ladies, pure, listen up, is the heading to the rest. 
It's like the fruit of the Spirit is love. And out of love flows what? Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control. Well, here's a heading. Anytime in the Greek that you have a list like this, the first is a heading. Because think about it. From purity comes what? Peace, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The first effect of godly wisdom on the mind is to make it pure. Pure. Purity reflects our heart. It reflects the heart of a wise person who has been regenerated because they have a new heart, right? Again, that's the promise of the new covenant. In fact, the word pure here means innocent and free from blame. Ladies, wisdom from above purifies the heart and the life. Christ himself is pure, right? There is no evil in him. He cannot even look at evil. So obviously those of us who have been called by him will reflect a life of purity. If someone gives you advice and it's not pure, I would flee from it. I don't know how many times a Christian has come to me and said, oh, have you seen this TV show? Oh, have you seen this movie or something? And I go, no, because I'm not a big TV watcher. I'm not a big movie watcher either. And, uh, but at times, you know, I'll find out or look it up or something, and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> There's no way I would watch that thing. And so it makes me wonder about their purity. Why would they ask me or encourage me to watch it? Or, you know, why don't you just live together before you get married? You know, I know churches, at least where I live, where there's people fornicating uh, and they're attending church and nothing's being done about it and everybody knows they're living together. That's not godly wisdom, right? That's foolishness. Or, you know, why don't you just cheat on your taxes this year? You know, I know we've had, we're all having financial problems, so just cheat on your taxes. What kind of wisdom is that? That's not pure, right? That's ungodly. That's unholy. The second characteristic of divine wisdom, it's peaceable. This means it causes others to live in peace with others. This wisdom does not cause strife. This person would rather settle disputes rather than provoke them. Listen, I know homes, I think I told you in one of the last sessions, where someone just told me recently, my husband and I argue every day. This is a professing Christian. I know homes where arguing and yelling is the norm of the day, and they profess to be called of God. That's not peaceable. My friend, this is not of God. But let me be clear that peace cannot be pursued at the expense of purity, right? So that's very important. John MacArthur says, Godly wisdom, purity, and peace go hand in hand. Peace is wisdom in action and is never established at the expense of righteousness. Some people equate peace with evading issues, but true peace can be very confrontational. Remember what Jesus says, I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. A man's enemies will be they of his own household. Ladies, sometimes we need to confront people with truth before we can have peace, okay? That's why we need to speak the truth in love. But the person who has wisdom from above will not go around stirring up discord. I know women that they just seem to like to stir up trouble. I don't know what it is. And if there's not any trouble going on, well, they'll get on the phone and make some. And I don't know why they like to stir up discord. Ladies, that's one of the things the Lord, seven things the Lord hates the most, right? Those who stir up discord among the brethren, he hates it. He absolutely hates it. It's an abomination. The third way we can know we're walking in wisdom is by being gentle. We've had this already. It means to be mild, reasonable, considerate of others, making allowances for their feelings, their weaknesses. In fact, we get our English word gentleman <laughs> from that. What happened to gentlemen? I don't think there are any anymore, do you? Do you guys ever see men opening the car door for people? I, I think they, one, I, I think that's gone. When I was dating, that was a big thing. You know, that's that how you knew this was the guy because he opened the car door. <laughs> But uh, I don't know what happened to gentlemen, but that's what the Greek word means in the English, gentlemen. Those who are called by God will also manifest wisdom by being, uh, James says, easy to be entreated or willing to yield. This is the fourth characteristic of divine wisdom. The words easy to be entreated actually doesn't occur anywhere else in the New Testament, and it means to be easily persuaded or submissive or obedient. It's someone who's not stubborn. Now, it doesn't mean to be persuaded in the wrong things. 
But it does mean if you're convinced by somebody that what you've believed is wrong, you're willing to change your views. You're not stiff. You're not unyielding. This is the person that will listen to the ideas of others and be willing to change. Uh, you know people that say it's my way or no way, right? And you've probably been around people like that. They're not going to listen to any ideas. Ladies, this is not of God. This is not of God. I've have heard my husband often say from the podium, I have strong convictions. I have very strong doctrinal convictions. But as a pastor, if I study the word of God and am become convinced that something I've believed all my life through study of God's word is I need to change my conviction or change, he said, I'll do it. I'm not stuck, so stuck to that. And ladies, we should be willing to change as we grow in the grace of Christ. The fifth characteristic of divine wisdom is it's full of mercy and good fruits. Showing mercy has the idea of showing compassion. Uh, it would be like the example of the good Samaritan who, you know, was uh, out and about and uh, this man was robbed of everything and stripped and left half dead and a, a Levite went by and a priest went by by on the other side so they didn't have to take care of him but uh, this good Samaritan he stopped and he poured in oil and wine into the wounds and then he talked to the the manager of the hotel so to speak and he said you know I've got to keep going but I'll leave you some denaria here and when I come back if that's not enough I'll give you more take care of this man ladies that is full that's someone who's full of mercy good fruits the good Samaritan got nothing out of taking care of that man nothing that man couldn't even pay him back for what he did but he did it because he was full of mercy and good fruits. That's just doing what is right, doing the right thing, right? Whether we get paid back or not, we just do it. The sixth manifestation of godly wisdom is without partiality. This means this is a woman who's unwavering. She's not indecisive about her commitment to God. She's confident of that. She's confident of what God's word says. Such a person has clear discernment of God's will and confident regarding her actions. She's not double-minded. She walks in a straight path. She doesn't waver back and forth. She's not unstable like that man in James 1 who, you know, is unstable in all of his ways. And when he's asking for wisdom, when going through a trial, he can't make up his mind. One day he trusts God, the next day he doesn't. And kind of makes you sick, like James says. It's just like the sea, back and forth and back and forth. And then he says that man doesn't receive anything of the Lord. The greater context, that man's not a believer. This person is without wavering. The last and seventh fruit of godly wisdom, they're without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. There's no mask. There's no disguise with this person. I'm not talking about the COVID-19 mask. <laughs> So all of you that are wearing masks, I'm not saying that you're a hypocrite. Uh, there's no mask. There's no disguise with this person. In fact, you know, in the Greek world and even in our world, uh, an actor is what? An actor, right? They're pretending to be somebody they really aren't. In fact, I thought it was funny when we went through TSA and we had to wear our masks. This is not in my notes. But the TSA guy said, pull your mask down, you know, because they want to see your face. That's because with the mask on, it's not really who I am, right? And so it has come to mean a person who acts differently from what they really are, right? So this is a person who is at home. A person who is without hypocrisy is a person at ho who he is at home is what he is at church, too. What he is in private, he is in public. They don't attempt to pretend or make good impression before others. So ladies, these seven characteristics of divine wisdom, pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy are from God. Why are they from God? They are consistent with his character. He's pure, he's peaceable, he's gentle, he's easy to be entreated, he's full of mercy and good fruits, he's without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And ladies, you who are called by God, you should be walking in these seven ways in this world. This is your calling. If you are not, there should be some serious self-examination. In fact, James closes his thought with the results of exercising divine wisdom in verse 18 by saying this. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What's he saying? The person who possesses this godly wisdom will sow all these fruits in an atmosphere of peace. 
This is the goal of peacemakers. They go around, they plant seeds for a crop that will give them what? An atmosphere of peace. In fact, it says, sown in peace by those who make peace. And James is using a, an imagery here of a farmer that when they go out and sow seeds in, a, a, in their land, they don't sow it in the midst of turmoil or tornadoes or storms, right? <laughs> At least I've never seen a farmer do that. But they go out and sow the seeds in what? In peace, in calmness. And what are the effects of that? Righteousness, a crop. Ladies, righteousness cannot effectively be sown where there's strife and turbulence, right? Nothing good comes out of that. In other words, these men and women, they're engaged everywhere in scattering blessed seeds of peace. And the result is a glorious harvest. What does Isaiah say in Isaiah 32:17? The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. My friend, we all reap what we sow. Some of us are reaping havoc by the ungodly wisdom we are sowing. Some of us are reaping a righteous harvest by the ungodly wisdom we sow. What about you? Now let's be honest with ourselves, okay, as we think about the following questions. Does your life manifest divine wisdom or demonic wisdom? Divine wisdom is pure. Demonic wisdom is polluted. Divine wisdom produces peace. Demonic wisdom produces strife. Divine wisdom is gentle. Demonic wisdom is harsh. Divine wisdom is willing to yield. Demonic wisdom demands to have its own way. Divine wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. Demonic wisdom is full of indifference and produces no fruit. Divine wisdom produces decisiveness based on God's word. Demonic wisdom produces confusion based on man's ideas. Divine wisdom comes from a holy life. Demonic wisdom comes from a life of hypocrisy. Now, what about you? Which category are you in? Maybe some more questions. Do the words you communicate to others come from above? Do they exhibit godly wisdom? When you give advice to other people, can it be backed up by the word of God? Is your advice backed up by a holy, upright life? Or is it earthly, sensual, demonical? When you give advice to other people, does it cause envy, strife, confusion, and every evil work? Do you leave paths of confusion and strife everywhere you go and with every life you touch? Or do you leave paths of peace and wisdom everywhere you go and with every life you touch. As we conclude, are you walking in wisdom in the world, in your church, in your singleness or marriedness, in your home, in your calling? I want to do something a little different as we close. I would like for you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3. I didn't plan to do this, but this was in my Bible reading this morning, and I thought it was so good. And I want to close by reading this portion of scripture before we take a little break and then we come back for the Q&A. But Proverbs 3, 13, starting with verse 13. Happy is the man that finds wisdom and the man that gets understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies and all the things that can desire not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. Wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retains her. The Lord by wisdom has founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, my son, let not them depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be your life and to your soul and grace to your neck. When you walk in your way safely and when your foot will not stumble, 
When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yea, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Don't be afraid of sudden fear, neither of the destruction of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being taken. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given us wisdom. And we know the beginning of wisdom or the beginning of the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And that's where we gain our wisdom. By fearing you, by knowing you, by loving you, by serving you. And I pray, Father, as we think about these things that we've talked about this weekend, walking in wisdom in our home and in the church and in the calling and in the world, Father, and in our singleness or our marriedness, whichever place we are, that, Lord, we can take these truths home and meditate on them, chew on them, ponder them, and then, Father, do something about them. And I pray that if any here in this room this morning are walking in foolishness, Lord, that they will repent and they will walk in wisdom with the God of all wisdom. Father, I pray for any also who are not redeemed, who have, oh, they might understand the gospel, that you died for their sins, that you were buried and you rose again. But Lord, they haven't, they're like the demons. They believe it, but they don't even tremble. And I pray, oh God, that you would arrest their heart, that you would call them by your name, that you would uh, uh, cause them to repent, to turn their life over to your lordship so that they too can walk in wisdom, walk in peace. Father, we would would be so pleased if you would save any in this room that are not saved, who do not know you. So Lord, help us as we take our break and then come back for the time, brief time of questions and answers. And I pray, God, you would help me not to lead anyone astray by any words I would speak, but may they be from your word. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.